much um, everyone for joining us at this very important uh, time. Uh, my name is Ben Backwell, I'm the CEO of GWEC. Um, I'm here with um, Elvia Ganum as well, who's uh, the GWEC um, Vice President and also um, the CEO of Abiolica in Brazil. Um, and we're very pleased to have uh, Dr. Fatih Birol uh, from the IEA, the Executive Director of the IEA, joining us um, to talk about this very important uh, moment. I want to kick things off uh, straight away. Um, it's very important uh, that we're all quite brief because there's um, a lot of uh, CEOs with important things to say on this call. So I'd ask everyone please to keep their interventions uh, to two minutes uh, or less and let's see how we get on uh, with the time. Um, and I'm, just to kick things off, um, Dr. Birol, can you, can you hear me, Fatih? I hear you very well, Ben. Thank you very much. Great. Well, thank you very much for, for joining us all, uh, joining us uh, all here. Um, what I'd like to do just to start is to ask you, uh, Fatih, how have uh, governments reacted to this new situation um, in the energy world post-COVID so far in your kind of experience and interaction? And what kind of recommendations are you and the IEA uh, making uh, to governments? Thank you very much, uh, Ben, to you and to all the colleagues. We have a very short period of time. I want to give you some highlights, uh, if I may. Uh, what we have done is that uh, we measure the impact of COVID on energy sector, the entire energy sector, oil, gas, electricity, renewables, efficiency, and uh, everything. We have the data until mid-May by country, by uh, sector, and others. And based on the uh, company plans, government plans, the guidance we got from them, and the projects, we made the expectation uh, throughout the 2020 how the global energy markets can uh, be affected from COVID. Couple of uh, points. First, global energy industry has never seen a shock like this since it is foundation. Big shock in terms of use, in terms of the investments, in terms of the employment consequences. Never such a big shock. We are seeing uh, that the, all the energy sources are affected from that, but with different degrees. The biggest shock is on the oil industry by far, because it is not only the effect of the uh, economy through coronavirus, but also the confinement is a key issue is <clears throat> two thirds of the oil consumption is through transportation sector, cars, buses, and uh, planes. Gas is the same, big shock and, and, and gas, huge amount of gas is available now. And uh, I was talking uh, just a few minutes ago with a journalist. We may well see in July a negative gas prices in Europe. We may well see negative gas prices in Europe in uh, July because the storage is uh, more or less uh, being filled, of course, if the, some of the exporters do not change their policies. Yes, coal, huge drop. Uh, the biggest drop since the Second World War in terms of uh, uh, coal. When it comes to renewables use of renewables, we see it is the only bright spot which is increasing its use. It is mainly driven by, it is mainly driven by uh, the cost, but also many governments are giving a priority access to grids to renewables around the uh, world. But when we look at the investments, not only the use, the investments, we see even for renewables, the picture is not very bright. We expect this year, renewables uh, investments, especially for solar and uh, wind uh, put together, uh, decline about uh, slightly more than 10%, coming from uh, everywhere except for uh, United States because of the tax credits uh, in the United States, but in Europe it is very serious. Uh, and uh, in uh, China and uh, uh, elsewhere. So now this is the picture and the, plus one final thing, the emissions, huge decline, 
decline of emissions we expect this year is going to erase or delete the increase of the emissions in the last 10 years globally. So this year's decline will compensate the increase in the last 10 years in the global uh, emissions, big decline. But in my view, it is not a reason to be cheerful because it is not happening because of the right government policies or technology, industry efforts. It is happening because of the people are dying premature deaths or global economy is more or less melting down, not as a result of right policies. And as we have seen in the financial crisis, 2008 and 2009, with the economic recovery, it can rebound quickly. So how can we stop this rebound and build a, a clean energy future? Some of you may know that uh, IEA was the first to raise the voice that the put the clean energy at the heart of the uh, economic recovery. We were the first one uh, uh, by far. And now we are working with many governments around the world, more than 30 governments, Europe, North America, Asia, uh, and others, to suggest them to put the right energy policies in their stimulus packages, most of them being once in a generation in scale, uh, trillions of dollars or billions of dollars, and we are working on those. On 19th of uh, June, we are going to come up with a list of measures that the governments, in our view, need to take into account, which would help to reach three goals. One, job creation. This is the number one concern of every government I can tell you around the world. And it will be more so in the next weeks to come. You will see. Second, those policies should also help to boost the economic growth. And third, they should help us to build a clean, resilient energy future. We cannot go to governments just by saying that push the green energy. You cannot do that. Because many governments' preoccupation today is jobs and economic growth, and rightly so. When I talk with the energy minister, they tell me, can you please give a call to finance minister as well? Finance ministers should be also on board for the economic recovery packages, energy-related issues. So it is the reason we pay a lot of attention what kind of realistic, pragmatic policies uh, we will come uh, uh, in our uh, special report on the sustainable recovery. And I am thankful to uh, uh, GIVEC to organize this meeting to hear from yourselves what do you suggest us to include in our catalog of measures to uh, uh, share with the uh, governments uh, around the uh, world. Again, emerging countries, uh, advanced economies, with uh, uh, all of them. Perhaps I, I want to finish by saying uh, that the, we are organizing to prepare this, uh, 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 discussing with you is a great opportunity. I just uh, organized only a few weeks ago uh, with uh, Klaus Schwab of World Economic Forum, Davos, for uh, several uh, CEOs to discuss what are their perspective. We organize many ministerial roundtables. I organize one with the Danish uh, minister, several ministers there. This Friday, with UK minister, having the Brazilian minister, Japanese minister, getting their views and put in this our uh, recovery packages. So, uh, uh, Ben, thank you very much for inviting me. If you have any questions, I'll be very happy to uh, uh, respond, try to respond to those, but I will appreciate very much to getting your views. Uh, my colleagues are going to take note of those to include in our a special report that we are going to advise governments uh, around the uh, world. So thank you very much. Thank you, Fatih, very much for that, for those opening remarks. We're going to move on to now a round of questions or contributions, and then we'll bring Fatih in again, and then we'll have another round of contributions. So I'd like to ask, first of all, Marcus Tacker, CEO of uh, Siemens Gamesa Renewable Energy, please. Marcus. 
Thanks. Uh, thanks for having the opportunity to uh, talk to you. Thanks, um, um, uh, Fatih Birol, for, for making that possible that industry um, ha has a voice in, in, in shaping that. As I have only two minutes, let me very briefly summarize uh, three topics I have in that regard. Um, um, number one, COVID-19 is, is a significant challenge for the industry. Um, we have been, um, we have been um, uh, fighting through that. As you say, it is the least impacted. However, um, there is an impact on the industry and global supply chains um, and working through that situation to have at the end of the crisis, of the COVID-19 crisis, an, an even stronger industry. That's what we need to do. Uh, certainly, demand on electricity is, is going down. Demand on other um, primary energy um, is going down. Um, I see it is an opportunity um, for especially the low gas prices to um, have an acceleration on the coal phase out. I mean, if these low gas prices, I think combined cycles um, could start, accelerate, accelerate the coal phase out to give some room for gas that would help to green the economy without harm, harming um, the overall renewable agenda. Um, we always said um, that gas is, is a bridging technology into um, a future um, all renewable um, power generation scenarios. Um, that could be an opportunity to build that bridge even faster, giving the low, low prices. Um, having said that environment, um, um, within that scenario, renewables need to continue um, to, to, to deliver um, the growing demand um, um, in, in overall power generation. And with that, um, I come to my second point. Re re renewables um, need to be an essential element of the recovery programs that are being drawn up around the world. I know um, you are working um, with IEA hard on these topics. I know European Union, is, is, uh, European Commission is working on these topics. So for me, it's instrumental that there is a link between the various um, renewable initiatives. Um, let, let's, let's take uh, the European Green Deal as, as an example to link that with the recovery programs um, um, by, by, by states but also by um, um, agreements like the European Union. So these plans need to be um, 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 aligned. The recovery programs need to have a green stimulus in order to push the overall agenda forward. Um, and that would be, for me, um, uh, the, the essential point um, uh, number two. And, and how to do this, um, I think there are three, three topics. N number one is, there is a tremendous regulatory framework in, in, in place, which limits the industry to be fast and agile. Um, sorting that out and getting some of the bureaucracy out of the way um, certainly will help, help um, though the regulatory framework should be eased, simplified to do um, investments in, into renewables. Um, with the, that um, also would um, a, a loosening, um, a, if it's only a temporary one, loosening um, of the state aid rules to ensure that utilities and IPs um, can invest in energy transitions fast uh, without a complex, complex regulatory considerations before such support can be granted from, from, from governments to, their, to utilities in country or IPPs uh, or developers in country. Um, certainly on a temporary notice, uh, but um, uh, if you want to have um, a quick um, um, uh, acceleration of the renewable industry um, that could be a hurdle that can be taken away. And the third one, you mentioned it, the renewable industry is, will, will create jobs. We are creating jobs um, significantly um, through building um, our in installations in the countries. At the same time, we need to be very careful not to fall in a trap in this situation to, to inc have increased local content requirements. Um, that might be a considerable risk in the current situation that there are special additional requests for local content requirements out of the um, overall um, uh, job creation initiatives, um, which is, is fully understood. Um, the, re the renewable industry and especially the wind industry um, is creating local jobs by um, um, the balance of plant, by building the site at such. Uh, by creating O and M um, maintenance jobs, um, by um, creating jobs of the operators. Um, however, uh, that that should that is a significant improve uh, contribution to to the economies. However, if we 
um, allow in this situation for additional local content requirements on, on equipment. Um, it will leave the industry after that situation with a complex structure, which is, will be costly. Um, it will not allow us to further cost reduct, reduce our costs and further cost reductions to reduce LSOE. So number one, um, to summarize, and then I'm already um, made my three key points. A key challenge, um, key challenges for me, it's an opportunity to ex accelerate um, actually the transition from coal into renewables, um, if, if you get it right. Um, to get this right, um, number two, recovery programs should be linked to um, um, a green stimulus. Um, and the third one is, in order to make it fast and agile, a regulator regulatory framework um, to be eased, um, loosening of state aids where, where possible for the temporary time and, and not falling into trap to allow for more local content. That's great, Thanks. thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Marcus, for that contribution. I, I pass now to Rafael uh, Mateo from Axiona Energy. Rafael, please. Hi, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hi, Fatih. How are you? Nice to, to see you again. Uh, before the COVID-19, the, the, the decision was very clear and also the direction. The direction was toward the energy transition. In despite of the big problems we were in front of, regulatory changes, uh, green constraints, uh, the fight against the zombie assets. But after the COVID, all the problems are more visible. And, and the sector is in front of more difficulties. And more than ever, the role of the government is more crucial than before, because we are in a different scenario, lower demand, lower prices of the competitors, lower prices of fuel, uh, poverty in customers, poverty in, in markets, FX uh, impact. Uh, so not everybody today is in favor of the direction that we had before. More than ever, that is necessary is to make more pressure over the regulators um, to, to change the, the way of your thinking. We need to rethink more in terms of value better than in terms of cost. We can't talk more about the cost of the renewables because the renewables are, are adding value in terms of jobs, in terms of health, in terms of long-term stability of pricing. So value against cost. And, and second point, stability of the regulators. You know well, Fatih, that we are today in front of several problems in several markets, several countries, uh, not in Europe. In Europe, as Marcus said before, the Green Deal, it's in a clear direction, but what happens out of Europe? We are suffering Mexico, we are suffering South Africa, we are suffering Ukraine. So there are many markets where today there is no room enough for everybody no room enough for all the assets and they, the regulator needs to choice between nuclear or renewables or fossil or renewables, cheaper or more expensive. So we are in, in a very bad situation again. We were in similar situation in some countries in the past and we need to be care of the regulation from, from organization as you or as Ben are, are today working. Uh, the, the, uh, to watch the, the regulators in order to ask for more stability. To, we can suffer short-term changes in the long-term investment because a couple of months, a three months or six months of poverty or six months of very expensive prices for the customers. We are very worried about the trajectory that the transition is adapting today in some, in some markets where the, where the government is questioning all the last uh, decade. So this is my, my, my thought. Thank you very much, uh, Rafael, for those points. Uh, Duarte Pelo from uh, EDPR, please. Hi, uh, uh, good afternoon, I think, for the fellow participants and thank you for the, for the invitation. Um, look, I think both Marcos and, and Rafael, I think that's most of the most important points I was going to mention. Um, I think, Ourselves as more of a developer, we have, I think we are on the, I think on the right side of, of, of the equation here, uh, to the extent that um, I think the impact relatively to other players in the industry is, is relatively lower. Um, but I would touch, I think, two or three points here that was mentioned before. Um, I think the renewables touch, I think, three of the points that Dr. Fatih mentioned um, in terms of job creation, economic growth, and green energy future. So we touch 
uh, we crossed the dots on all of them, uh, and I think we need to um, to capture that opportunity uh, going forward. I would stress out, I would say, two points where the initiatives really need to have impact. I think the first one, not also on the regulatory front of putting processes more simpler, I think the people that do the development, this is very local. Uh, it's not national in a lot of times, in a lot of the circumstances. So the measures need to go not only from a national level, they need to locally. They need to be locally. Uh, the permitting, the bureaucracy, in terms of environment, in terms of whatever is needed on a local basis, needs to be swifter. And I think that without that, uh, we will not be able to comply with targets, with new investments. And I think all of the measures that start in Europe, for instance, from the EU, EU level, the European Commission, they need to have a clear path on how they can reach the communities where the projects are. They're being sold on wind, on short, offshore, whatever. That is probably the most relevant uh, obstacle we have, more than finance, more than uh, um, regulatory in terms of the re regulatory framework. I would say that if we want to accelerate growth, though, that is probably the biggest obstacle I think we see, in, in, at least from our perspective at, at TDPR. And I think the second one is that there are instruments, um, and, and also talking a little bit about Europe, where uh, we could accelerate growth. And I'm talking especially about, I think, two, and some of them have already been, I think, uh, mentioned in, 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 in some of the, the Green Deal uh, documents is around, obviously the governments need to have a big role here. Um, and so one of the options would be to accelerate the CFD auctions that are broadly uh, uh, included in, in all of the geographies in the EU, so bringing them forward so that they provide the significant visibility for the developers and for the investors and for the turbine manufacturers and for the solar panel producers to, to invest in, 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 uh, in new projects. Uh, and I think that is something which is potentially easier to do to the extent that we could put forward some of the targets in terms of the decarbonization, that would be something which would help not only obviously the renewables business, but the economy itself. So I think that ticks the box on, on, on that. Uh, and also given that in, in several countries, it's applicable I think to, to the rest of the world, a key growth instrument required is long-term PPAs, corporate PPAs. Um, to some extent, the markets are not liquid enough in several of our geographies. And if there are some multilateral instruments that can provide security for the investor, that would be probably something which would help a lot, complementing the growth in Europe, but advancing with new growth in other markets which are, um, which are less advanced. Um, and so I think those two aspects, I think that the regulatory and bureaucracy goes to the local level and that we are able to provide the frameworks being CFDs auctions or PPA support, I would say that I would add those two things to the to the comments made before. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Duarte, and uh, very, very interesting points, uh, those around uh, demand and corporate PPAs as well. Um, we go now to uh, Jerome Pecres, the CEO of G Renewable Energy. Jerome, thank you for thank, joining Thanks, Ben. Uh, hello, hello, Fatih. Uh, just a few points on my side. I think the first one is in line with what Marcus said. I think renewable is growing because it provides the best solution for low cost electricity in most places of the world. And we can do that because we can leverage a, a global supply chain. And it's important that we keep the ability to do so, so that we can provide our benefits to the planet and the climate while continuing to lower the cost of electricity. And any excessive push toward local content would go against that trend because it would result in an immediate increase in the cost of our components and hence the cost of electricity. So we would not want that to happen. And I think it would be to the detriment of the industry at large. Second thing, when we look at the various plans being done by the government and the European Union to do more renewable and in particular more wind, we think there is a significant pocket of opportunity around the repowering of existing wind farm in Europe, but I would say not only in Europe, in every places where you have old wind turbines getting to seven, 10 years of age. And I think most of the plants that we see emerging, I hope, will, increase, will include 
some significant incentives to repowering uh, under the form of faster permitting, because you basically use the same piece of land to generate more electricity and cheaper electricity, and, and possibly some economic benefits where that makes sense. I mean, as you know, Fatih, we discussed it, we have a very significant repowering activity in the US already, and I think it would be the interest of everybody for that repowering to become meaningful I mean, in Europe and elsewhere. It can be either tear down repowering when you replace small turbine by bigger turbine, or even repowering where we, you keep I mean, a significant part of the infrastructure and of the turbine and just expand the rotor. But I think here, there is a big pocket of market demand for renewable with limited problems in terms of public acceptability. One constraint to that, and we know it as an industry and we have a role to play, is around the recyc re finding recycling solution for the blades, which is something where each of us are developing solutions that work and are going to work even better. So I think repowering should be at the forefront of government and Europe initiatives. The third message and my last one is let's not forget the grid. I mean, the, this growth of renewable is going to put more requirements into the grid. Uh, governments and the European Union needs to keep investing into the grid to accommodate increased renewable content. They need to invest in grid security. They need to invest in grid stability. And they also need to invest into interconnections between the grid to provide more resiliency to the system, accommodate higher renewable loads in the various parts of the, of the geography. And I think that sometimes the, the forgotten part of the energy transition, and these are big infrastructure projects, which I hope to see coming in most of the stimulus package because they make them in that cell, and then they would provide leverage for more growth in renewable. Thank you. Thank you, Jerome. Go to Andy Kinsella, the CEO of Mainstream Renewable Power. Andy. Thanks very much, Ben. Uh, thanks very much, Fati, for joining us. And thanks very much, everyone. Good, good to see you all. Um, look, from a mainstream point of view, you know, we feel we need to fully grasp a unique opportunity we have to create uh, what we refer to in mainstream as a confident green world. The World Bank recently said if stimulus packages simply return countries to where they were before COVID-19, we will face the same problems tomorrow that we faced yesterday. Low productivity, high pollution, locked in carbon intense economic structures. Our post COVID recovery plans must avoid unconditionally bailing out carbon intensive industries. All capital deployed must be in support of scientifically based measurable plans of action that drive the world's transition to net zero. Without binding agreements on reducing greenhouse gas emissions, the world's carbon gap grows even larger, making it more difficult and more costly to set us on a trajectory to net zero. We urgently need policies that fulfill three important criteria. Firstly, they must be coordinated internationally. Secondly, they must be binding nationally. And importantly, these criteria must have real financial consequences so that those who do not meet their obligations feel the pain of non-delivery. Simply put, the polluter must pay. These payments should be ring-fenced to protect the vulnerable who are most impacted. There must be a just transition from coal, oil, gas, to clean energy, and there must be a global price for carbon. The post-COVID recovery plan must be focused on net zero outcomes, which deliver the greatest benefit to the global economy. Borrowing must be invested in sustainably productive assets, in clean energy infrastructure, and clean energy research and development. These investments not only reduce electricity generation costs and limit pollution damage, but by applying normal multiplier effects, deliver far greater returns than investment in carbon intensive industries and deliver far more jobs. We must focus the trillions we will spend on a once off investment in a green recovery and deliver a confident green world. Thanks very much, Ben. Thank you, Andy. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to go back to Fatty now just for some quick uh, responses to the points so far. Fatty. Uh, quick is not very easy, but I will try to put a few things uh, together. Uh, first of all, I mean, when we talk with many uh, renewable companies, wind uh, and uh, beyond, I see three big challenges. One, around the world, government budgets are being squeezed. If the governments have uh, smaller budgets, their appetite to give support to uh, X, Y, or Z uh, may well be uh, 
a bit less than uh, before. This is number one challenge. Second challenge is several uh, medium and small size renewables companies are in a very difficult uh, situation. And those smaller medium sized renewable companies are doing big job in many markets, but they are under heavy financial pressure. This is the second. Third, cheap natural gas prices may be another factor for some governments when they think of the renewable uh, uh, position in, the, uh, in terms of their support. So I see these three important challenges. Coming back to a couple of uh, 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 answers to very, very helpful, Ben. Thank you very much for all the uh, colleagues uh, for this uh, uh, suggestions. We will definitely uh, take them on board. But uh, the point from Marcus, from Siemens Gamesa, in an ideal world, we are completely right. Cheap gas would mean lower coal. But we are, tomorrow, we are publishing our world energy investment. When I look at the FID for coal up to today, you will see that the global, car, uh, global coal fleet continues to increase. And even the first few months, when I look at the numbers, it is even, the speed is higher than the 2019, mainly driven by some Asian uh, countries, if you also include the Pakistan uh, uh, to that, but also China, Indonesia, uh, 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 Cambodia, and others. This is uh, the uh, situation. Now, I, uh, I completely agree with you that the EU is the leader today in terms of the Green Deal, and it, when it comes uh, quickly, and I hope it will come out very soon, it can be an inspiration for uh, many uh, different parts of the world. I have, as uh, some of you may know, just two days ago, uh, Mr. Timmermans and myself wrote the op-ed just outlining how a EU Green Deal can uh, 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 look like. It is short-term and a bit medium-term. Short-term, renewables efficiency, a bit longer term, uh, 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 electrolyzers, dash hydrogen, and uh, 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 batteries. But the problem is, EU is responsible only 8% of global emissions. 92% comes from somewhere else. So with EU alone, alone we cannot fix this problem if our problem is the decarbonization. So therefore, we should find ways as uh, some of the colleagues uh, mentioned, in other parts of the world, we have to get them uh, on board. A couple of very quick things. Predictability. This will be a key uh, uh, emphasis point in our recommendations to governments. Predictability, predictability, predictability. And this would be, uh, I believe, uh, 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 in many markets, Regardless of their political position in terms of climate change, this will be well received, I know, in Europe, in North America, US, Canada, and in some other uh, uh, countries. Now, the three points, namely job creation, economic growth, and clean energy transition. It is, good, it is easy to say for me that renewables help all of them. But the difficult thing is, or it's what we are doing, the difficult thing, we are calculating different options because renewables are not the only, only option in front of the uh, governments. How much jobs you can realistically create from wind, onshore wind, offshore wind, and also their multipliers compared to others. Leave aside to other points that uh, some of the colleagues mentioned, the value creation. This is very good, but to be honest with you, uh, the clean air, even decarbonization, is not the item number one in many ministers' minds, to tell you the truth. The first thing is job creation, and the second thing is economic growth. We are working on those to give the uh, uh, suggestions to uh, governments. I think it was uh, Jerome who mentioned it, I completely agree, 
in Europe, uh, the key question is uh, uh, today uh, the repowering. It's a big issue and we are giving with numbers how critical it is for uh, uh, many countries. And again, the issue of grids is extremely important. Why it is important, the grids? We need to accommodate larger share of wind and solar in a world which investments for hydropower is not growing. Some others, some countries do it nuclear, not growing. Electric batteries, stagnant. How we are going to uh, uh, get the uh, renewables, uh, increasing share of renewables in an electricity secure way in the absence of grid investments, which are in a serious decline? It's a key issue as well. And perhaps uh, I stop uh, here uh, for Thank Noah Ben for the other colleagues' uh, reactions. Thank you, Fatih. Uh, I'm going to bring in uh, Philippe Cavafian <coughs> uh, from MHI Investors now. Um, if we can all try and speed up a little bit, I really want to get everyone in. And I know Dr. Birrell has a hard stop at uh, 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 50. So thank you. Philippe. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to meet you again. Thank you for your team. Very good analysis that is continuously feeding us. Um, as you know, MHI Vestas is a pure player in offshore wind. And as such, our activities did not suffer too much in the short term. We have been keeping installing wind farms. Uh, we finished one in Belgium. We just started one in the Netherlands just on time. Resilience is good, but being a long-term or long-cycle business has some pluses, but also some uh, minus, especially when the economic recovery plans are looking for jobs in the short term. So my first remark would be that the important perspective to put on offshore wind is to federate the large infrastructure project that comes along with the development of offshore wind. You can think about harbor infrastructure for the logistics. You can think about the grid connection, the power island that were recently promoted in Denmark, or even the federating power of uh, the power to hydrogen with the uh, hydrogen infrastructure that can create uh, with the long-term, mid-term, and short-term job creation. And so I think putting a continuum of uh, job creation and a long-term uh, job uh, volume with the infrastructure project is key in the perspective of the government. I'd like to ask you a question for, because you are frequently in contact with the oil and gas majors and uh, volatility has always been a characteristic of oil market and uh, they are remarkably adjusting to ups and downs but we have hit the negative price which is uh, an unprecedented event and you just mentioned gas prices that are going to come negative in Europe. Um, so when we see this extreme volatility do you see in the major oil and gas uh, uh, attractiveness of renewable that has a little bit more stable revenue even if it's a trade-off with their usual profitability. So I will leave you with this observation for midterm and long-term job creation that is a locomotive uh, with offshore wind and the question for the oil and gas. Thank you. Thank you. Bring in uh, Shen uh, Zongying from, <coughs> from China, please, from Mingyang Smart Energy Group. Mr. Shen, some very quick comments, please. I think you're on mute, Mr. Shen. Uh, let me start by saying a few numbers for China. China's first year GDP was down by 6.8%, 6 and uh, the electricity consumption was down by 6.8%. And the good news is renewable generation actually increased more than 10%, while coal was down by 8%. So that's the good news. And this year is supposed to be a big year for the wind industry in China. And we're expecting 35 gigawatt new install capacity. But the bad news is the first quarter, the new capacity installed is only 2.36 gigawatt. It's down by 50%. And uh, China is having its National People's Congress meeting right now. And uh, my chairman is a member of the National People's Congress. He's having the meeting right now. 
and he made three proposals relating to the wind industry to the National People's Congress of China. Number one, extend the deadline for onshore grid parity by six months and uh, extend the uh, offshore wind central government subsidy, uh, subsidy deadline by 12 months. That's very, very important for our industry in China at this very moment. Number two, to support wind turbine manufacturing business to provide more employment opportunity and put the wind business in the heart of the economic recovery. Number three, uh, in where we are to continue to encourage offshore wind development and to really do the energy transition for really having coal fire power in the southern China. And, uh, you know, this year we have 15 gigawatt order in hand. Six of them is in offshore. For, so it's very critical moment for us to work both in China and uh, we'll be happy to work with, with all of you here and uh, look forward to see some of you in the near future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Shen. Um, Jose Luis Blanco from Nordex, please. Uh, thank you, Ben. Uh, thank you, Dr. Fatid. Hi, colleagues. Uh, I think most of it uh, has been said. Three messages from Nordex. Uh, COVID-19 has impacted society and economies. Worldwide governments are striving for recovery. And in our view, it's important to ensure that this recovery, societies and, and economies are set on a sustainable uh, pathway in order to save climate and environment for us and the generations to come. And the green industry is ready to deliver climate-friendly energy that create, I would say, the most number of jobs per unit of, of, of energy out of, the, out of the available opportunities. So that can support very well economic development. Second, some countries and regions uh, like European Union have already announced to strive for a green recovery. However, there are some governments that seem to be tempted to put climate policies and energy market reforms uh, and those plans for renewable energies to the shelf and even uh, or even roll back uh, those uh, progressive uh, developments, arguing that a quick, a quick fix for the economy is a priority. Uh, but such actions escalate climate costs and jeopardize investments into climate-friendly and sustainable economy development. Third, from our perspective, it's important that international, regional, and national recovery program focus on a green recovery to avoid a fossil lock-in effect. It must be avoided that the recovery funds are used for investment into sectors that bring us out of the reach of the Paris climate goals, and for this uh, is particular, uh, particular important investments into green uh, energy sectors, since energy is one of the main emitters of greenhouse uh, gases. Our industry in this regard is not asking for subsidies. The recovery programs need to ensure enabling environments for wind power, and this is regulation that fits the purpose, including the right market design and secure continuation of clean energy auctions. Second, very important in our view, safeguard existing and awarded projects, removal of regulation barriers uh, where they exist in order to enable corporate and users to purchase renewable energy, uh, ener renewable energy project and renewable energy it itself, and increase the ambition to decarbonize. As said at the beginning, wind industry is ready to deliver your three key points, job creation, economy growth, clean, resilient energy, energy future. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jose Luis. Can we go to uh, uh, Declan uh, Flanagan from Orsted, please? Thanks. Um, so, I would say that uh, the renewables industry broadly went into the crisis in a strong position due to the competitiveness that many of the speakers have mentioned. Uh, the industry has shown its resilience during the crisis in terms of operations, construction. We've continued a very ambitious, broad global construction plan on, on schedule, on budget during the crisis, and crucially continue to grow employment. Uh, we've maintained employment in our construction and added new projects. We've added uh, a lot of new uh, 
uh, employees during the crisis. So we've really demonstrated a resilience of the sector, access to capital has continued, etc. Uh, so long term, the, what the industry needs for long term success post the crisis are the same as were needed before the crisis. And I would summarize in, in two factors. One is market design and long-term price signals to support what are 30 plus year investments. And uh, crucially to encourage our customers to sign long-term contracts, because I do worry that the balance between the risk between the, the sponsors and customers, be they commercial customers, uh, traditional utility customers is a little imbalanced. So we need market design that supports long-term price signal to support investments. Uh, particularly with storage coming increasingly uh, into the equation, we need market design that encourages the adaption of storage. And I see that uh, as, as potentially a, a barrier to uh, acceleration of storage, uh, coupled with renewables, wind and solar. So second uh, is transmission. Simply put, markets that invest in bulk transmission uh, and regionalize large scale markets attract the most renewables in investment. And so we need investment in transmission it happens to be a good way to uh, a no regrets public infrastructure investment that will get broad-based employment and will uh, 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 draw in renewables infrastructure so market design and transmission have always been what we needed and continue what we need thank you declan i think those are those are very very important points um uh, mr suman senior it's very good to see you on this call and thank you very much for joining us from india and it'd be really good to get your perspective from from, from a non-European, uh, such an important market as India. Suman. Thank you, thank you, Ben. Um, you know, there are quite a few things. Obviously, uh, in India, the power demand uh, during the period of the lockdown that was going on for about two months, uh, power demand fell by about 25% during that time. Uh, and it's picked up since then to about a 10 to 15% decline. But fortunately for us, all that decline has come out of thermal capacity and not out of renewable capacity. And so renewable capacities in India have uh, uh, must run status. And so we carried on running all of our uh, plants. So in that sense, uh, the government has been positive in, in terms of trying to shelter renewable energy capacities. Now, I think going forward, um, there are some very interesting developments that are happening. I think number one is the fact that uh, we are now getting to a point where the government is now experimenting with firming up renewable energy and not just continuing to have options for plain vanilla, wind or solar. And we just won a recent um, auction for 400 megawatts of, of renewable energy capacity at, to be delivered at a plant load factor of 80%. And that obviously requires us to combine a large amount of wind with some amount of solar to, to get to that number. And uh, it requires us to set up almost 1300 megawatts of, of uh, clean energy uh, projects. And so I think this kind of thing is gonna become more common as we go forward, as the government finds that the cost of storage has come down and can start looking at trying to combine uh, uh, renewable energy sources to make them firmer as we go forward. And that then of course uh, helps the grid quite substantially. Uh, I think what we require from the government is a couple of things. Number one is we need faster bidding. Uh, the bidding process right now is fairly slow. Uh, it takes a lot of time to get a bid out. I think we need more bids, especially if the government wants to meet its target of getting to 175 gigawatts of capacity by 20, December 2022, which there isn't that much time left for that. The second thing is we need a lot of structural reforms in the power sector. We need the distribution utilities to get uh, fundamentally reformed because they're the ones that uh, buy the power from us. And I think as the point that has been made earlier is we need faster transmission build out and faster grid management and better grid management. So I think those are the fundamental factors that we require for a a uh, faster rollout of renewable energy capacity because we're beginning to hit these physical constraints. So even if the government wants to push it faster uh, in response to trying to, you know, trying to use it as a stimulus measure for the economy, there are these physical constraints that have to be addressed along with it. Uh, the one point that I think uh, is interesting is that even though we have a lot of, I mean, you know, we're obviously dealing right now with disrupted financial markets, uh, <clears throat> given all the, all the issues that are going on globally. And there is a risk of sentiment right now as capital you know, uh, continues to sort of go away from the developing economies. And I think it's in this kind of a situation that we need really the multilateral financing entities to really step up much more substantially than they're stepping up right now. And I think um, we need that multilateral capital to come in, whether it's from 
lending agencies like the AIIB or like the New Development Bank or the World Bank or the IFC um, or the Asian Development Bank. You know, we need more of these kinds of financiers to come in and provide large amounts of capital to be able to pump prime the renewable energy sector and get more capacity addition to, to be going. So I think that is something that is very important. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sue. And um, Keith Anderson, and uh, sorry, last but not least of the CEOs. Hi, uh, Ben, thanks. Um, welcome to everyone else. So look, just then a couple of points. I think uh, you know, a lot of stuff's been covered off by others. Um, uh, from the Scottish Power, part of the Abadrola Group, we've kind of been on this this transition for you know for over twenty years, um, and I think during that time and looking back before that time, one of the things I, I kind of firmly believe, and as an organisation, we firmly believe, is that investment in infrastructure is one of the greatest opportunities and greatest ways to drive recovery, uh, any kind of economic recovery. Uh, just because of what it does down through the supply chain, procurement, the creation of jobs. And I think the brilliant opportunity we have now is to drive that as a, as a green infrastructure uh, recovery and really, really use this. Uh, this is an opportunity to push forward uh, to hit net zero carbon uh, in as many countries as we can across the world as quickly as we can. Um, you know, we're a, a huge supporter of uh, your electrification, renewable electrification to, to create that pathway to net zero. A um, couple of things, you know, and some of this has been touched on, but the things that we think, the two main things we think are vital to, to, to open that up. Um, one is in and around the area of finance. Obviously in the, the current crisis, it has created uncertainty around funding and financing, uh, around the cost of that finance, um, and therefore that drives through to, to willingness to commit uh, and get to a final investment decision for companies. So. I think your know, organizations, institutions like the EIB, um, you know, in, in, in the UK, you know, some of the investment banks that have been set up can provide a huge amount of that support. We saw that be incredibly effective on the back of uh, 2008 and the financial crisis. So again, anything those kind of institutions can do to start bringing that stability uh, and access to money back to the market, I think is absolutely vital and critical. Um, you know, and at the end of the day, uh, what we're doing is supporting and driving forward investment in the lowest form of energy, uh, which ultimately brings down cost to consumers. As part of that as well, you know, and, and backing up that financial framework, um, market mechanisms like contracts for difference, I think, become even, even more important uh, in as many countries as possible. They're a brilliant way of de-risking uh, the upfront investment. I think a fantastic way of driving volume through the market. Uh, an excellent way of, of providing that kind of stability. And at the end of the day, they actually drive countries and economies away from subsidy because they end up providing the lowest cost to consumers and driving the price down and lowering the price of energy down. So that would be the finance point. And then the other main one would be in and around permitting. You know, permitting drives everything. Uh, if we want to create infrastructure investment and we want to accelerate infrastructure investment. Um, so if we can get permitting really speeded up right across any of the countries, that drives the rest of the timeline for projects, it drives the timeline for placing orders, drives the timeline for construction, for supply chain, uh, and also obviously ultimately the supply of the power as well. So I would look and, and push um, for all, all countries, member states of the EU, to push forward with the permitting rules uh, in the mm -hmm. Renewable Energy Directive, um, get those pushed through, for new projects, but also critically, absolutely critically, as others have said, for repowering. Um, overall then, just a kind of summary, um, where we are as an organization, um, we are ready to make massive investment. We wanna push ahead with investment. Um, so anything that helps to stimulate that, anything that helps to give us the clarity and the openings to do that, uh, we'll push ahead really, really quickly. It will provide cheap sources of energy, it'll provide jobs, it will create economic recovery. Um, in fact, already in the, in the first kind of quarter, the first four or five months of this year, we've actually accelerated our investment. We've already made over four billion pounds worth of orders out there. So it shows you the kind of strength, uh, and I think also the, uh, you know, the willingness for big companies um, you know, and others on this call to really drive forward an economic recovery, and it's just about how we use that how we make sure we grab that opportunity and we make sure we accelerate it. And then it's about 
how does the how do institutions like the EU, like the individual countries and governments, how do they link their recovery plans to what we can do and what we can deliver for them uh, to really unlock all of that potential, to get the most we can get out of it in terms of jobs, uh, in mm -hmm. terms of contracts, uh, in terms of economic recovery, uh, in terms of manufacturing, and ultimately in terms of low cost energy. So um, I think uh, lots of opportunity out there. We just need to make sure we link up the right bodies, the right institutions, the right governments uh, to really get the greatest um, the greatest boost out of the opportunity. Thanks. Thank you, Keith. I mean, it seems clear to me, I mean, we're going to have to fight very, very hard as an industry to stay on the front foot. And I mean, I, I appreciate, Keith, your you know, positive perspective on this. I, I fully agree with you, but I think we're going to have to work pretty hard. And I think, um, you know, probably Europe is going to be probably the easiest one to solve in that it's more coherent than, than many places in the world. Um, but as you know, Fatih Birol said, it's something like 8% of emissions. So um, I think there's going to be a lot of hard work to do in possibly less kind of equipped countries in policy terms to try and keep the agenda uh, going and to try and make sure that kind of short term uh, fixes aren't adopted and also the uh, market um, kind of pressures around, you know, price and, and um, demand don't uh, start to impact mm -hmm. us in a bigger way. Um, I, I just wanted to bring in very quickly uh, Elbia uh, from Brazil. Do you have any final comments, Elbia? I mean, coming from a large emerging markets co economy. Uh, well, okay, Ben, thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, in this discuss is very important for uh, us to understand that uh, we have a very short term scenario about COVID. When I bring this experience for Brazil, uh, we know that we have a very good basic for increased investments in renewable and highlight wind. We are expected uh, wind offshore for the next five years. We are prepared model for ocean for wind offshore. But uh, here in Brazil, our, our big challenge is GDP. Uh, the crisis ar arrived here in two 2014, and the, uh, we are waiting to to better situation. But uh, now in this year, uh, we we hope that we, we expect that we would have a, a crown. But because of COVID, the GDP will decrease about six, many six percent. Then our regulatory uh, framework is good. We are changing something, but it's uh, marginal changes. We have the ocean, we have the market. We have a good signs for investments. Our sources basically is renewable and the renewable here is very competitive. Then we have uh, good conditions for uh, increasing renewable. Uh, the report for, from uh, IEA has helped because uh, uh, this point about job creation, resilience in green energy future is a uh, uh, discussion that we needed to put. In Brazil, maybe the, the first and the second one, the job creation, social effects from renewable. But I believe the, the focus and discussing this is uh, can uh, put good value for us. Uh, well, thank you, Albia, for that. And uh, I, I mean, I, I, I think the demand side is something that we're really going to have to uh, look at in many different ways across lots of different uh, markets. Dr. Biro Fati, I believe you have to go. You have another uh, a ministerial call. So I can tell you two things, two minutes, and I will go if I, if I may, Ben. Is it okay? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Please do. I would uh, first uh, the Philip's question. Because you are right, uh, Philip. I talk with the oil and gas CEOs, but I talk with the renewable CEOs more than I talk with oil and gas CEOs, just to make this uh, remark. But especially European uh, uh, majors, oil and gas companies, see this low oil and gas prices as an opportunity for increasing their uh, renewable portfolios, for sure, very clear. And there are some already you see or you will see that already some acquisition steps from those uh, European and non-European uh, 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 oil and gas uh, uh, companies. And I would all suggest you, tomorrow we are coming up with a report, World Energy Investment Report, looking at the returns 
of the renewables versus oil versus gas in the last few years. A, 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 a very granular analysis we did with the Imperial College, you will be very happy to see how renewable returns uh, were much better than many oil and gas companies, which we are going to share uh, with the public uh, 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 as of uh, tomorrow. But yes, there is an interest there. Just to, uh, high, uh, just to uh, slightly calibrate something, negative prices, gas prices in Europe, I said, may well be, it is not 100%, but may well be, they are going down. The storage capacity is coming to 100% very soon. Anyways, we have less than $1 uh, 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 MBTU gas prices. I am uh, thankful to you and all the colleagues. We will get on about all of these uh, uh, suggestions, uh, questions. I didn't have time to go uh, all of them one by one. But if I can leave you with one, uh, one suggestion from my side. Decarbonization, positive role of renewables, decarbonization alone cannot be a selling point today for the many governments. I don't say all, but for many governments. We have to make it uh, our hands clear if we want to have renewables to getting a, a bigger share. The neither decarbonization nor the declining cost of renewables alone can shelter the renewables from the effects of COVID. We have to show very clearly and unbiased manner, the job creation value added to economy of uh, uh, renewables, and it is what we are uh, going to do, including all of your uh, comments. I thank you very much, and uh, 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 my uh, big appreciation for GVEC uh, and all the CEOs spending uh, 45 minutes with us today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fatty. Do you know there's a whole series of kind of forums uh, coming up it's very very important that the wind industry is represented you know in a strong way at a kind of ceo level and that we really can kind of um, uh, you know use our influence in terms of the job creation uh, and investment capacity that we have as an industry so thank you very much for the support and uh, you know please uh, continue to support in these efforts thank you everyone